Hi, everyone. Uh, so for the next session, we have Jay Harrell from uh, Quantstem, and uh, she'll be talking about uh, digital nations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about what digital nations are and uh, kind of going into that. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Okay. And Okay, so what is a digital nation? So we're gonna be unpacking this. We're gonna look at some, try and unpack some terms and just kind of go through this. People have been talking about stuff like this recently. And um, yeah, we think it's, it's a pretty cool subject. So first thing we need to look at is kind of the evolution of web right so from web one which is very passive consumer con uh consumer of content to web two which is very interactive uh interactive um and user-based um user uh, generated content uh the problem is is interact is the interactivity um of course who is owning this this content so that's kind of one of the the problems um, but the internet itself has provided itself as a new para uh, paradigm. Um, and through this movement, we have gotten to, um, you know, Web3. And why Web3? Web3 is, uh, well, because currently today's most used uh, platforms are just a handful of companies and they uh, essentially monetize the, you know, all of your, all of your data. So, okay, so Web3, so how do we break through this? We need to decentralize these. And that's one of the things that people are talking about when it, com when it comes to Web3. Um, so the future vision is to have an anti-fragile system that is transparent, it's opt-in, uh, privacy is available when needed, um, security is, is, is there and built part of the system. And we have control over the data that we use, that is used. So no single entity controls as decentralized and increases uh, usage and usability. Um, and so that's sort of the, the, the vision of Web3 that everyone talks about. And a lot of this can be uh, attributed to early examples um, of uh, thinking in terms of these organizations. Um, uh, open like open value networks. So an early example is Sensorica. Um, the OBM model applies to open decentralized uh, networks. The idea is interact is to be able to have an, a collective interact with other collectives um, uh, and organizations as a collective, uh, but is highly adaptable and um, is anti fragile and um, and isn't able to be sort of co-opted uh, in, in, in any negative manner. Um, unfortunately, this example didn't, didn't end up working out. It was a little too early um, and they were having trouble with, uh, with um, they had a little bit of trouble with, with the actual accounting of it. But of course, this led, this sort of thinking led into this idea of a DAO um, and, uh, and this sort of early framework came out of this idea of, of swarm uh, or sort of digital collectives um, to get rid of silos of information. And so, you, so this collective of like and individuals um, uh, try to organize together, but without any hierarchy uh, and not centralized. So this concept eventually led to um, actual doubt, and we'll get to that in a minute. But even TechCrunch had, was, had uh, commented on it, saying that it's a paradigm shift in the, uh, the very idea of economic organization. It offers complete transparency, total shareholder control, unprecedented flexibility, and autonomous governance. So it's a pretty big thing for TechCrunch to say. But of course, we know what happened. Uh, the, the DAO, which was first created in 2016, ultimately got hacked and uh, led to a um, contentious hard fork of of uh, Ethereum to Ethereum Classic as well. Um, but I think there's a lot of learning from that and the seeds of course were set. Um, and since that, uh, that time, 
Uh, DAOs had formed and started to manage and use various uh, cryptocurrencies without giving control, and and uh, and it gives increased traction. Um, oh, and, and the traction of it, it increased over the last year. And what did we actually end up having? Well, these are some current examples. So in 2018, we sort of saw a bit of a rebirth. Uh, 2019, we saw reduced friction overall. And then by 2020, um, incentives uh, were clear and it really gave people a reason to cooperate. You know, um, Badger DAO, for example, is the DAO, is the technical um, infrastructure that allocates the funding resources and votes the funding resources towards development of Badger DAO or of, of Badger, which is sort of a DeFi money management system for. Um, for collateralized Bitcoin on Ethereum. Um, but then um, uh, Metacartel, uh, Metacartel and Moloch are different forms of DAO uh, contracts that allocate funds um, based on the, the, how the community has, has interacted with them. So those are technical examples. But you can still, uh, uh, you can still um, think of these as, as decentralized autonomous organizations. And of course, Maker DAO, ha, there is a DAO and people vote on the future of, of Maker. So they're actually working and they're actually happening. We found a use case. Um, and then continuing uh, down that path, what we found is, um, you know, with, of course, DeFi, we also have seen a great um, growth in decentralized storage systems. And uh, there's other forms of funding uh, like Gitcoin. Um, which is more of a donation-based system. And, uh, and also various uh, tools have been created um, in order for the commons, for these DAOs of commons to be able to participate, interact and, and work together. Um, so we're seeing this continuing to build, which is which was really great. It's really healthy because you know, now there's different forms of DAOs and people can go and um, work in multiple DAOs and now they have tools to operate between. And so uh, shaping the world, our world through uh, self-organization and borderless communities. Um, DAO and Web3 communities have now shown to offer a new way for both technical and non-technical community members to find a unique niche that resonates with them. These communities will give us options for uh, communities that you can join and shape society in certain ways. Uh, and, they, and, the, and again, they interact with outsourced organizations that are centralized. In fact, um, we as a company have interacted with a few DAOs uh, to produce uh, audits and security reviews and provide uh, consultation to people within these DAOs. So it is, it is, it is really happening and it's really working. Now let's take a look at SushiSwap. Um, of course, everyone remembers SushiSwap from DeFi Summer. Uh, it is a AMM uh, protocol that was launched uh, you know, in the summer amidst all this yield farming craze. And of course, it has since grown to be a very successful AMM. Um, it was originally a code fork and um, somewhat of just pretty much full on fork of Uniswap. Works very sim similarly. Um, and Sushi Governance uh, gave token holders governance rights to vote on proposals and improving the protocol. And Sushi now looks very different than what it did. And really all they're working from is a Discord. They have a DAO um, that manages funds and then they have uh, key people that, are, that uh, understand and are trying to coordinate and everyone is, is coordinating together. So they have positioned themselves as an evolved community oriented version of Uniswap. Uh, and and it, 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 people want it. It works. And this now it's you know if you use SushiSwap, it's a very uh, it's a it's a very mature product. And it's there is no ownership group, right? It is just it is just a bunch of people. Um, of course, it got very famous as well because the because uh, there was a, a risk in the way the the contract was set up, and Chef Nomi ultimately rugged everyone and. Uh, dumped on market, but um, later the funds were were returned, um, and there was a it was it was all okay. But if we look at some other uh, other communities, 
you know, we look at Super Super Rare, which is a marketplace for uh, for single edition uh, digital artwork. Um, what's interesting about uh, uh, Super Rare is they're trying to be the art gallery of um, of uh, the NFT space, and you have a highly engaged community of uh, of artists, collectors, and enthusiasts. They're all coordinating um, on Discord. You have um, an organization that is that are that are releasing these, and then they're just open as a marketplace. But it's still a a community. I don't believe it uses a DAO in terms of a in terms of a the technical aspects, but it is still um, a digital community that that exists um, ethereally. Another great example is Zora. Uh, Zora is similar to uh, Rarible, if anyone's familiar with that. The difference being that it is more of a platform for creators to create platforms for themselves. So a good example is, uh, is RAC had, had used the um, Zora platform, but it allows them to, you to create uh, tokenizations of your work as well as the N uh, NFTs. And, and it really builds upon these, these early ideas that people saw with uh, open value networks and this and this kind of thing that makes it more equitable for an artist. And of course, um, through Zora, the Saint Frame uh, Saint Fame DAO, decentralized brand organization that sold Fame tokens tied to a limited edition shirt created by uh, crypto designer Matthew Vernon, uh, and of course, uh, collaboration with uh, Grammy Award winning artist, uh, winning singer songwriter producer or songwriter, producer, web three artist, um, uh, RAC to a handful of, uh, with a crowd sale to a, with a limited edition cassette uh, version of the album. Um, and this, this tape was created via, um, via Zora. So it's an extension of that. And we see the application, right? $40 billion uh, music industry is the average revenue in, US, in the US, but only about 12% of that is actually captured by the artist. Uh, currently, royalty distribution systems is outdated, unreliable, and doesn't prior, uh, prioritize the artist. So NFTs are fundamentally changing how we think about digital ownership. And if we continue down this, this path uh, about music communities, you look at uh, Justin Blau uh, released a single in 2021 called Everything on Nifty Gateway in January. Um, he is a huge proponent of the movement. And if you look at what he says, you know, he's very uh, uh, emphatic that it's a, that's a, that's a, a really interesting um, and engaging movement. I envision a future where limited edition NFTs of songs or albums follow a similar structure to prints in photography or lithographs in art. Collectors are driven towards owning an authenticated copy that is digitally signed by the original creator or artist, simply because that collector has a deeper personal relationship with the song. Now, on a bit of a note, I don't believe that DRM is a good application for uh, NFTs, um, simply because what Blau is talking about is the, the tangible, the intangible collectibleness. Um, whereas DRM is trying to just use it as a locking mechanism when I, that, that's just not going to translate. Having something unique is very different than just trying to lock the song out. Um, and if we continue over to gaming communities, Axie Infinity is creating, uh, is creating a digital pet universe where players can earn tokens through gaming. Um, and what's really interesting is it's, it, it's a earn to, uh, play to earn model. Not only do you play and earn through participating on it, but as well, there's an incentivi incentivization to actually work on the game itself. So from working on it to playing on it, it's all together in this, in this digital community um, where uh, people are incentivized to, to, uh, to almost uh, contribute. It's, it's passion work in, in a way. Um, and in fact, they recently sold $1.5 million worth of uh, land value in Axie Infinity. So it's, it's clearly working and pe people clearly want more of this. And if we continue down that, um, down the gaming path, we see Skyweaver by uh, Sequence, previously known as Arcadian. 
uh, digital ownership in game, uh, gaming. Players actually own the cards in real world value. Each card is secured and registered on Ethereum on the Ethereum blockchain. So you can think of it like, you know, like one of those digital magic, the gathering games, except um, the cards are actually rare and they actually are worth something outside of the game itself. And we're even seeing this in terms of development. Um, now, Raid Guild is one example. There's a few examples, but this is a, a digital collective um, that actually offers digital, you know, that actually offers development services um, for uh, interacting or for, for whatever you need. And you're when you interact with them, you're interacting with them you know, via a collective. It's, they don't exist anywhere. There isn't, there isn't an entity. They are just, um, they're just a group of people. They are a digital nation. And if we think of Wall Street Bets, well, Wall Street Bets is a DAO. It operates very similar. It's a, it's a collective of like-minded individuals with a common goal, decentralized structure, no leaders, no hierarchy, it's just on a Reddit board. They're a decentralized autonomous organization. And what is their, what are they as an organization? They're a uh, hedge fund. They're a digital hedge fund that operates on a Reddit board. And so if we apply sushi, uh, sushi swap to the OVN model, um, we can, things become a little bit more clear. You know, you gotta zoom out to, to see. So I'm gonna, so I first overlaid this with, um, the uh, stacks layer that actually the Federal Reserve of uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis provided a very so they they've been looking into DeFi and they've said DeFi has unleashed a wave of innovation in the financial industry and if we look at that okay so um, asset management okay so sushi swap is an asset management it's all sitting on Ethereum which uh, its biggest uh, trading pair is is Bitcoin. And if we zoom in, we see that there's a bunch of community members uh, in the community. And then um, in the commons itself is the actual core products and what, the reason to build the value prop, what drives people and what gets people excited and what brings value to everyone individually. And around that, they have tools. They're using Snapshot. They're using um, uh, putting out their own documentation. They're using Discord. And that brings people in deeper into the to this this uh, development, and anyone can can join. And to the observer, which is crypto Twitter in this in this case, can see what goes on. And in this example, we see uh, Chef Nomi is of course also acting as a um, both a contributor initially and then um, exiting the system via the exchange. But this just is more to illustrate that people can wear different hats and they operate around this. Uh, decentralized autonomous organization, this open value networks, uh, open value network. So what are digital nations? Uh, they're self-organized, borderless communities. Communities are built from uh, the ground up, primarily focused on community, profit is secondary, and there's an equalization effect where opportunities for people all over the world uh, partake in early stage product development and equity financing. Where does Quantstamp uh, uh, where's Quantstamp's role? Well, we are proud to secure some of the most innovative communities within art, music, gaming, and more. Uh, so we secure the assets and infrastructure in your digital nation. Thank you very much for joining me. And uh, if you would like to learn more, you're more than welcome to. Just uh, uh, if you if you're able to. Um, you can scan that QR code and that will bring you to the newsletter link, or you can head to our blog, go to quantstamp.com slash blog. Uh, and if you just scroll to the bottom or on quantstamp.com, you'll also find the newsletter link. So thank you very much. My name is Jay and uh, yeah, th those are digital nations and that's where we see uh, everything going. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. Uh, the, that was pretty interesting for sure. Um, just a couple of questions coming in, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so someone's asking, how do we prevent something like sushi swap in the future? Because we already have two DAO hacks in the past, and like, uh, like, how is it possible to to? Well, yeah. sushi swap is um, it's debatable as to whether like that wasn't a hack. Yeah. They used Uniswap's features as a way to 
you know, get liquidity. Um, it, it, I don't know that it's very easy for any project to be able to absorb that kind of liquidity because you, because the amount of excitement needed for a particular project, it was riding a wave. It was on, at the right time and it was able to just gain traction really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily think those are necessarily preventable. And I also don't necessarily think that's necessarily a problem because of the, the, because of how quickly everyone's been able to iterate in the last six months, we have gone from, you know, very basic DeFi to finding a use case to AMMs to very, very advanced tools. Um, you know, whether they're ready for mainstream is to be decided, but, you know, there was a huge amount of development in the last six months, specifically because you can just fork the code. Right. And ultimately what wins out is the, the one with the better team, the one who was able to, to get themselves, like to create that movement. Um, and it, it's, yeah, it's a little bit um, unfortunate, but I, I'm also not a big fan of protectionist um, uh, thinking. So I don't know that you can really protect against that. Um, but the DAO that happened in 2016, that was because of a re-entrancy. And that kind of stuff can be pre prevented by making sure that your code is good and, and getting it checked and, you know, come talk to us about security. Like, you know, it was a really, it, you know, in hindsight, um, the, a, a, having a re-entrancy is, is, is co go, completely defeats the purpose of, of what Ethereum is, which is, you know, Turing, Turing complete, so it's yeah. not supposed to do that. Yeah, makes sense. And there's just one last question. Uh, we've been asking all our speakers. Um, uh, before that, I'll just take Darnell's question. Uh, he's asking, uh, how many AMM are there in the crypto space? I mean, I'm not sure. There might be, there's probably a bunch, um, but the ones that people actually use, um, you know, there's also aggregators, right? So the people, or the ones that people use are probably Uniswap, SushiSwap. Um, then there's a bunch of DEXs, there's IDEX. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, if you were to go to one inch exchange or Paraswap, those will be able to give you an idea of like how many different well-used AMMs currently exist. There's probably room for more, but um, you know, there is something to be said with, with um, you know, an existing movement. And that, that's kind of the differentiating fa factor here is, is when you have these open systems, then culture and the movement behind it ultimately secures its future and um, uh, momentum, if, if, if you will. Um, yeah, so this question is about NFTs, and I think I already know your answer to that. Uh, it is just that, uh, what's your take on NFTs? Are they are they like gonna go on, or are they just gonna die down? It's just a it's just a hype that we are seeing these days. Um, well, sure, you know NFTs currently are in a hype cycle. Yeah. Let's not forget that, and none of this is fi financial advice. Um, but NFTs are probably a very good bridge to mainstream adoption. I mean, we're seeing artists that have traditionally had a lot of trouble um, being able to earn for their work, uh, actually earn for their work. And, you know, if we think of really famous paintings, you know, it's been a very insular art world with a very small amount of people funding money to, to do this art. It's not, it's not open, it's not accessible. Um, is it gonna? Is it still gonna be hard for someone to to uh, maybe get art, like to sell their art? Sure. I mean, you're still having to pitch yourself, and it's still like what people are wanting to to get. But it is it completely changes the the mechanics and um, just simply the model of the art world. And I think that is here to stay. Yeah. And you also mentioned uh, music in there and the market share of music in there. That, that's also quite exciting. Yeah, we're, we're pretty excited about it. We think there's a, a huge amount of growth here. Um, but, you know, like, like anything, like these are art markets, right? This isn't, you know, there, there, there needs to be 
a buyer on the other side for who wants it. Um, so then people who, who are buying it are really, you know, you have to want the art as well yeah. because these are, there, there's something culturally important and um, intangibly um, uh, emo something emotional about it. And that's something that is not, um, that, that, is, that is not in, in other kinds of markets yeah. in that regard. Yeah, I've got an interesting one here and I will promise that's the last one. What are you seeing has been the onboarding time for artists to learn and learn, use and implement NFTs? I have an article coming out this week okay. um, that will take someone from zero to a hundred who's never, who, who, if you're an artist and you've never touched MetaMask or, or blockchain or anything, this article is for you. Um, and it'll take, take an hour of your time, maybe three hours if, uh, if you're having trouble. But um, yeah, it is specifically designed for someone who has trouble. Um, yeah. Where, be, where we'll be able to find that article? Sure. Quantstamp.com slash blog, and I'll probably also tweet it out. Perfect. Thank you so much for taking out the time, Jay. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.